Chapter One of The Road. Recording by Barry E. The Road by Jack London. Chapter One. Confession. There is a woman in the state of Nevada to whom I once lied continuously, consistently, and shamelessly for the matter of a couple of hours. I don't want to apologize to her, far be it from me, but I do want to explain. Unfortunately, I do not know her name, much less her present address. If her eye should chance upon these lines, I hope she will write to me. It was in Reno, Nevada, in the summer of 1892. Also, it was fair time, and the town was filled with petty crooks and tin horns, to say nothing of a vast and hungry horde of hoboes. It was the hungry hoboes that made the town a hungry town. They battered the back doors of the homes of the citizens until the back doors became unresponsive. A hard town for scoffings was what the hoboes called it at that time. I know that I missed many a meal, in spite of the fact that I could throw my feet with the next one when it came to slamming a gate for a poke out or a set down or hitting for a light piece on the street. Why, I was so hard put in that town one day that I gave the porter the slip and invaded the private car of some itinerant millionaire. The train started as I made the platform, and I headed for the aforesaid millionaire with the porter one jump behind and reaching for me. I had no time for formalities. Give me a quarter to eat on, I blurted out. And as I live, that millionaire dipped into his pocket and gave me, just precisely, a quarter. It is my conviction that he was so flabbergasted that he obeyed automatically, and it has been a matter of keen regret ever since, on my part, that I didn't ask him for a dollar. I know that I'd have got it. I swung off the platform of that private car with the porter maneuvering to kick me in the face. He missed me. One is at a terrible disadvantage when trying to swing off the lowest step of a car and not break his neck on the right-of-way, with, at the same time, an irate Ethiopian on the platform above trying to land him in the face with a number eleven. But I got the quarter. I got it. But to return to the woman to whom I so shamelessly lied. It was the evening of my last day in Reno. I had been out to the racetrack watching the ponies run, and had missed my dinner, i.e. the midday meal. I was hungry, and furthermore, a committee of public safety had just been organized to rid the town of just such hungry mortals as I. Already a lot of my brother hobos had been gathered in by John Law, and I could hear the sunny valleys of California calling to me over the cold crests of the Sierras. Two acts remained for me to perform before I shook the dust of Reno from my feet. One was to catch the blind baggage on the westbound overland that night. The other was first to get something to eat. Even youth will hesitate at an all-night ride on an empty stomach, outside a train, that is tearing the atmosphere through the snowsheds, tunnels, and eternal snows of heaven-aspiring mountains. But that something to eat was a hard proposition. I was turned down at a dozen houses. Sometimes I received insulting remarks, and was informed of the barred domicile that should be mine if I had my just desserts. The worst of it was that such assertions were only too true. That was why I was pulling west that night. John Law was abroad in the town seeking eagerly for the hungry and homeless, for by such was his barred domicile tenanted. At other houses the doors were slammed in my face, cutting short my politely and humbly couched request for something to eat. At one house they did not open the door. I stood on the porch and knocked, and they looked out at me through the window. They even held one sturdy little boy aloft, so that he could see over the shoulders of his elders the tramp who wasn't going to get anything to eat at their house. It began to look as if I should be compelled to go to the very poor for my food. The very poor constitute the last sure recourse of the hungry tramp. The very poor can always be depended upon. They never turn away the hungry. Time and again, all over the United States, have I been refused food by the big house on the hill, and always have I received food from the little shack down by the creek or marsh, with its broken windows stuffed with rags, and its tired-faced mother broken with labor. Oh, you charity mongers, go to the poor and learn, for the poor alone are the charitable. They neither give nor withhold from their excess. They have no excess. They give and they withhold never from what they need for themselves, and very often from what they cruelly need for themselves. A bone to the dog is not charity. 
Charity is the bone shared with the dog when you are just as hungry as the dog. There was one house in particular where I was turned down that evening. The porch windows opened on the dining room, and through them I saw a man eating pie, a big meat pie. I stood in the open door, and while he talked with me, he went on eating. He was prosperous, and out of his prosperity had been bred resentment against his less fortunate brothers. He cut short my request for something to eat, snapping out, I don't believe you want to work. Now this was irrelevant. I hadn't said anything about work. The topic of conversation I had introduced was food. In fact, I didn't want to work. I wanted to take the westbound overland that night. You wouldn't work if you had a chance, he bullied. I glanced at his meek-faced wife, and knew that but for the presence of this Cerberus I'd have a whack at that meat pie myself. But Cerberus sopped himself in the pie, and I saw that I must placate him if I were to get a share of it. So I sighed to myself and accepted his work morality. Of course I want to work, I bluffed. Don't believe it, he snorted. Try me, I answered, warming to the bluff. All right, he said. Come to the corner of blank and blank streets. I have forgotten the address. Tomorrow morning. You know where that burned building is, and I'll put you to work tossing bricks. All right, sir. I'll be there. He grunted and went on eating. I waited. After a couple of minutes, he looked up with an I-thought-you-were-gone expression on his face and demanded, Well? I, I am waiting for something to eat, I said gently. I knew you wouldn't work, he roared. He was right, of course, but his conclusion must have been reached by mind-reading, for his logic wouldn't bear it out. But the beggar at the door must be humble, so I accepted his logic as I had accepted his morality. You see, I am now hungry, I said still gently. Tomorrow morning I shall be hungrier. Think how hungry I shall be when I have tossed bricks all day without anything to eat. Now if you will give me something to eat, I'll be in great shape for those bricks. He gravely considered my plea, at the same time going on eating, while his wife nearly trembled into propitiatory speech, but refrained. I'll tell you what I'll do, he said, between mouthfuls. You come to work tomorrow, and in the middle of the day I'll advance you enough for your dinner. That will show whether you are in earnest or not. In the meantime, I began, but he interrupted. If I gave you something to eat now, I'd never see you again. Oh, I know your kind. Look at me. I owe no man. I have never descended so low as to ask anyone for food. I have always earned my food. The trouble with you is that you are idle and desolate. I can see it in your face. I have worked and been honest. I have made myself what I am. And you can do the same if you work and are honest. Like you? I queried. Alas, no ray of humor had ever penetrated the somber, work-sodden soul of that man. Yes, like me, he answered. All of us? I queried. Yes, all of you, he answered, conviction vibrating in his voice. But if we all become like you, I said, allow me to point out that there'd be nobody to toss bricks for you. I swear, there was a flicker of a smile in his wife's eye. As for him, he was aghast. But whether at the awful possibility of a reformed humanity that would not enable him to get anybody to toss bricks for him, or at my impudence, I shall never know. I'll not waste words on you, he roared. Get out of here, you ungrateful whelp! I scraped my feet to advertise my intention of going, and queried, And I don't get anything to eat? He arose suddenly to his feet. He was a large man. I was a stranger in a strange land, and John Law was looking for me. I went away hurriedly. But why ungrateful? I asked myself as I slammed his gate. What in the dickens did he give me to be ungrateful about? I looked back. I could still see him through the window. He returned to his pie. By this time I had lost heart. I passed many houses, but without venturing up to them. All houses looked alike, and none looked good. After walking half a dozen blocks, I shook off my despondency and gathered my nerve. This begging for food was all a game, and if I didn't like the cards, I could always call for a new deal. I made up my mind to tackle the next house. I approached it in the deepening twilight, going around to the kitchen door. I knocked softly 
and when I saw the kind face of the middle-aged woman who answered, as by inspiration came to me the story I was to tell. For know that upon his ability to tell a good story depends the success of the beggar. First of all, and on the instant, the beggar must size up his victim. After that, he must tell a story that will appeal to the peculiar personality and temperament of that particular victim. And right here arises the great difficulty. In the instant that he is sizing up the victim, he must begin his story. Not a minute is allowed for preparation. As in a lightning flash, he must divine the nature of the victim and conceive a tale that will hit home. The successful hobo must be an artist. He must create spontaneously and instantaneously, and not upon a theme selected from the plentitude of his own imagination, but upon the theme he reads in the face of the person who opens the door, be it man, woman, or child, sweet or crabbed, generous or miserly, good-natured or cantankerous, Jew or Gentile, black or white, race prejudiced or brotherly, provincial or universal, or whatever else it may be. I have often thought that to this training of my tramp days is due much of my success as a story writer. In order to get the food whereby I lived, I was compelled to tell tales that rang true. At the back door, out of inexorable necessity, is developed the convincingness and sincerity laid down by all authorities on the art of the short story. Also, I quite believe it was my tramp apprenticeship that made a realist out of me. Realism constitutes the only goods one can exchange at the kitchen door for grub. After all, art is only consummate artfulness, and artfulness saves many a story. I remember lying in a police station in Winnipeg, Manitoba. I was bound west over the Canadian Pacific. Of course, the police wanted my story, and I gave it to them, on the spur of the moment. They were landlubbers, in the heart of the continent, and what better story for them than a sea story? They could never trip me up on that. And so I told a tearful tale of my life in the hell ship Glenmore. I had once seen the Glenmore lying at anchor in San Francisco Bay. I was an English apprentice, I said, and they said that I didn't talk like an English boy. It was up to me to create on the instant. I had been born and reared in the United States. On the death of my parents, I had been sent to England to my grandparents. It was they who had apprenticed me on the Glenmore. I hope the captain of the Glenmore will forgive me, for I gave him a character that night in the Winnipeg police station. Such cruelty, such brutality, such diabolical ingenuity of torture. It explained why I had deserted the Glenmore at Montreal. But why was I in the middle of Canada going west when my grandparents lived in England? Promptly, I created a married sister who lived in California. She would take care of me. I developed at length her loving nature. But they were not done with me, those hard-hearted policemen. I had joined the Glenmore in England. In the two years that had elapsed before my desertion at Montreal, what had the Glenmore done and where had she been? And thereat I took those landlubbers around the world with me. Buffeted by pounding seas and stung with flying spray, they fought a typhoon with me off the coast of Japan. They loaded and unloaded cargo with me in all the ports of the seven seas. I took them to India and Rangoon and China and had them hammer ice with me around the horn and at last come to moorings at Montreal. And then they said to wait a moment and one policeman went forth into the night while I warmed myself at the stove, all the while racking my brains for the trap they were going to spring on me. I groaned to myself when I saw him come in the door on the heels of the policeman. No gypsy prank had thrust those tiny hoops of gold through the ears, no prairie winds had beaten that skin into wrinkled leather, nor had snowdrift and mountain slope put in his walk that reminiscent roll. And in those eyes, when they looked at me, I saw the unmistakable sun-wash of the sea. Here was a theme, alas, with half a dozen policemen to watch me read. I, who had never sailed the China Seas, nor been around the Horn, nor looked with my eyes upon India and Rangoon. I was desperate. Disaster stalked before me incarnate in the form of that gold ear-ringed, weather-beaten son of the sea. Who was he? What was he? I must solve him ere he solved me. I must take a new orientation, or else those wicked policemen would orientate me to a cell, a police court, and more cells. 
If he questioned me first, before I knew how much he knew, I was lost. But did I betray my desperate plight to these lynx-eyed guardians of the public welfare of Winnipeg? Not I. I met that aged sailor man glad-eyed and beaming, with all the simulated relief at deliverance that a drowning man would display on finding a life preserver in his last despairing clutch. Here was a man who understood and who would verify my true story to the faces of those sleuth hounds who did not understand, or at least, such was what I endeavored to play act. I seized upon him. I volleyed him with questions about himself. Before my judges I would prove the character of my savior before he saved me. He was a kindly sailor man, an easy mark. The policeman grew impatient while I questioned him. At last one of them told me to shut up. I shut up, but while I remained shut up, I was busy creating, busy sketching the scenario of the next act. I had learned enough to go on with. He was a Frenchman. He had sailed always on French merchant vessels, with the one exception of a voyage on a lime juicer. And last of all, blessed fact, he had not been on the sea for twenty years. The policeman urged him on to examine me. You called in at Rangoon, he queried. I nodded. We put our third mate ashore there, fever. If he had asked me what kind of fever, I should have answered, enteric, though for the life of me I didn't know what enteric was. But he didn't ask me. Instead, his next question was, And how was Rangoon? All right. It rained a whole lot when we were there. Did you get shore leave? Sure, I answered. Three of us apprentices went ashore together. Do you remember the temple? Which temple? I parried. The big one, at the top of the stairway. If I remembered that temple, I knew I'd have to describe it. The gulf yawned for me. I shook my head. You can see it from all over the harbor, he informed me. You don't need shore leave to see that temple. I never loathed a temple so much in my life. But I fixed that particular temple at Rangoon. You can't see it from the harbor, I contradicted. You can't see it from the town. You can't see it from the top of the stairway. Because, I paused for effect, because there isn't any temple there. But I saw it with my own eyes, he cried. That was in... I queried. 71. It was destroyed in the great earthquake of 1887, I explained. It was very old. There was a pause. He was busy reconstructing in his old eyes the youthful vision of that fair temple by the sea. The stairway is still there, I aided him. You can see it from all over the harbor, and you remember that little island on the right-hand side coming into the harbor? I guess there must have been one there. I was prepared to shift it over to the left-hand side, for he nodded. Gone, I said. Seven fathoms of water there now. I had gained a moment for breath. While he pondered on time's changes, I prepared the finishing touches of my story. You remember the custom house at Bombay? He remembered it. Burned to the ground, I announced. Do you remember Jim Wayne? He came back at me. Dead, I said. But who the devil Jim Wayne was, I hadn't the slightest idea. I was on thin ice again. Do you remember Billy Harper at Shanghai? I queried back at him quickly. The aged sailorman worked hard to recollect, but the Billy Harper of my imagination was beyond his faded memory. Of course you remember Billy Harper, I insisted. Everybody knows him. He's been there forty years. Well, he's still there, that's all. And then the miracle happened. The sailor man remembered Billy Harper. Perhaps there was a Billy Harper, and perhaps he had been in Shanghai for forty years and was still there. But it was news to me. For fully half an hour longer, the sailor man and I talked on in similar fashion. In the end, he told the policeman that I was what I represented myself to be, and after a night's lodging and a breakfast, I was released to wander on westward to my married sister in San Francisco. But to return to the woman in Reno who opened her door to me in the deepening twilight, at the first glimpse of her kindly face, I took my cue. I became a sweet, innocent, unfortunate lad. I couldn't speak. I opened my mouth and closed it again. Never in my life before had I asked anyone for food. My embarrassment was painful, extreme. I was ashamed. I, who looked upon begging as a delightful whimsicality, thumbed myself over into a true son of Mrs. Grundy, burdened with all her bourgeois morality. Only the harsh pangs of the belly need could compel me to do so degraded and ignoble a thing as beg for food. 
and into my face I strove to throw all the wan wistfulness of famished and ingenious youth unused to mendicancy. You are hungry, my poor boy, she said. I had made her speak first. I nodded my head and gulped. It is the first time I have ever asked, I faltered. Come right in. The door swung open. We have already finished eating, but the fire is burning and I can get something up for you. She looked at me closely when she got me into the light. I wish my boy were as healthy and strong as you, she said. But he is not strong. He sometimes falls down. He just fell down this afternoon and hurt himself badly, the poor dear. She mothered him with her voice, with an ineffable tenderness in it that I yearned to appropriate. I glanced at him. He sat across the table, slender and pale, his head swathed in bandages. He did not move, but his eyes, bright in the lamplight, were fixed upon me in a steady and wondering stare. Just like my poor father, I said. He had the falling sickness, some kind of vertigo. It puzzled the doctors. They never could make out what was the matter with him. He is dead, she queried gently, setting before me half a dozen soft-boiled eggs. Dead, I gulped, two weeks ago. I was with him when it happened. We were crossing the street together. He fell right down. He was never conscious again. They carried him into a drug store. He died there. And thereat I developed the pitiful tale of my father, how, after my mother's death, he and I had gone to San Francisco from the ranch, how his pension, he was an old soldier, and the little other money he had was not enough, and how he had tried book canvassing. Also, I narrated my own woes during the first days after his death that I had spent alone and forlorn on the streets of San Francisco. While that good woman warmed up biscuits, fried bacon, and cooked more eggs, and while I kept pace with her in taking care of all that she placed before me, I enlarged the picture of that poor orphan boy and filled in the details. I became that poor boy. I believed in him as I believed in the beautiful eggs I was devouring. I could have wept for myself. I know the tears did get into my voice at times. It was very effective. In fact, with every touch I added to the picture, that kind soul gave me something also. She made up a lunch for me to carry away. She put in many boiled eggs, pepper and salt, and other things, and a big apple. She provided me with three pairs of thick red woolen socks. She gave me clean handkerchiefs and other things which I have since forgotten. And all the time she cooked more and more, and I ate more and more. I gorged like a savage, but then it was a far cry across the Sierras on a blind baggage, and I knew not when nor where I should find my next meal. And all the while, like a death's head at the feast, silent and motionless, her own unfortunate boy sat and stared at me across the table. I suppose I represented to him mystery and romance and adventure, all that was denied the feeble flicker of life that was in him. And yet I could not forbear, once or twice, from wondering if he saw through me down to the bottom of my mendacious heart. But where are you going to? she asked me. Salt Lake City, said I. I have a sister there, a married sister. I debated if I should make a Mormon out of her, and decided against it. Her husband is a plumber, a contracting plumber. Now I knew that contracting plumbers were usually credited with making lots of money, but I had spoken. It was up to me to qualify. They would have sent me the money for my fare if I had asked for it, I explained, but they have had sickness and business troubles. His partner cheated him, and so I wouldn't write for the money. I knew I could make my way there somehow. I let them think I had enough to get me to Salt Lake City. She is lovely and so kind. She was always kind to me. I guess I'll go into the shop and learn the trade. She has two daughters. They are younger than I. One is only a baby. Of all my married sisters that I have distributed among the cities of the United States, that Salt Lake sister is my favorite. She is quite real, too. When I tell about her, I can see her and her two little girls and her plumber husband. She is a large motherly woman, just verging on beneficent stoutness. The kind, you know, that always cooks nice things and that never gets angry. She is a brunette. Her husband is a quiet, easy-going fellow. Sometimes I almost know him quite well. And who knows, but some day I may meet him. If that aged sailorman could remember Billy Harper, I see no reason why I should not some day meet the husband of my sister who lives in Salt Lake City. On the other hand, I have a feeling of certitude within me that I shall never meet in the flesh my many parents and grandparents. 
You see, I invariably killed them off. Heart disease was my favorite way of getting rid of my mother, though on occasion I did away with her by means of consumption, pneumonia, and typhoid fever. It is true, as the Winnipeg policeman will attest, that I have grandparents living in England, but that was a long time ago, and it is a fair assumption that they are dead by now. At any rate, they have never written to me. I hope that woman in Reno will read these lines and forgive me my gracelessness and unveracity. I do not apologize, for I am unashamed. It was youth, delight in life, zest for experience, that brought me to her door. It did me good. It taught me the intrinsic kindliness of human nature. I hope it did her good. Anyway, she may get a good laugh out of it now that she learns the real inwardness of the situation. To her, my story was true. She believed in me and all my family, and she was filled with solicitude for the dangerous journey I must make ere I won to Salt Lake City. This solicitude nearly brought me to grief. Just as I was leaving, my arms full of lunch and my pockets bulging with fat woolen socks, she bethought herself of a nephew or uncle or relative of some sort, who was in the railway mail service, and who, moreover, would come through that night on the very train on which I was going to steal my ride. The very thing. She would take me down to the depot, tell him my story, and get him to hide me in the mail car. Thus, without danger or hardship, I would be carried straight through to Ogden. Salt Lake City was only a few miles farther on. My heart sank. She grew excited as she developed the plan, and with my sinking heart I had to feign unbounded gladness and enthusiasm at this solution of my difficulties. Solution. Why, I was bound west that night, and here was I being trapped into going east. It was a trap, and I hadn't the heart to tell her that it was all a miserable lie. And while I made believe that I was delighted, I was busy cudgeling my brains for some way to escape. But there was no way. She would see me into the mail car. She said so herself, and then that mail clerk relative of hers would carry me to Ogden. And then I would have to beat my way back over those hundreds of miles of desert. But luck was with me that night. Just about the time she was getting ready to put on her bonnet and accompany me, she discovered that she had made a mistake. Her mail clerk relative was not scheduled to come through that night. His run had been changed. He would not come through until two nights afterward. I was saved, for of course my boundless youth would never permit me to wait those two days. I optimistically assured her that I'd get to Salt Lake City quicker if I started immediately, and I departed with her blessings and best wishes ringing in my ears. But those woolen socks were great. I know. I wore a pair of them that night on the blind baggage of the Overland, and that Overland went west. End of Chapter 1 Chapter Two of The Road by Jack London. Chapter Two, Holding Her Down. Barring accidents, a good hobo with youth and agility can hold down a train despite all the efforts of the train crew to ditch him. Given, of course, nighttime as an essential condition. When such a hobo, under such conditions, makes up his mind that he is going to hold her down, either he does hold her down or chance trips him up. There is no legitimate way, short of murder, whereby the train crew can ditch him. That train crews have not stopped short of murder is a current belief in the tramp world. Not having had that particular experience in my tramp days, I cannot vouch for it personally. But this I have heard of the bad roads. When a tramp has gone underneath, on the rods, and the train is in motion, there is apparently no way of dislodging him until the train stops. The tramp, snugly ensconced inside the track, with the four wheels and all the framework around him, has the cinch on the crew, or so he thinks, until some day he rides the rods on a bad road. A bad road is usually one on which a short time previously one or several trainmen have been killed by tramps. Heaven pity the tramp who is caught underneath on such a road, for caught he is, though the train be going sixty miles an hour. The shack, brakeman, takes a coupling pin and a length of bell cord to the platform in front of the truck in which the tramp is riding. The shack fastens the coupling pin to the bell cord, drops the former down between the platforms, and pays out the latter. The coupling pin strikes the ties between the rails, rebounds against the bottom of the car, and again strikes the ties. The shack plays it back and forth, now to this side, now to the other. 
lets it out a bit and hauls it in a bit, giving his weapon opportunity for every variety of impact and rebound. Every blow of that flying coupling pin is freighted with death, and at sixty miles an hour it beats a veritable tattoo of death. The next day the remains of that tramp are gathered up along the right-of-way, and a line in the local paper mentions the unknown man, undoubtedly a tramp, assumably drunk, who had probably fallen asleep on the track. As a characteristic illustration of how a capable hobo can hold her down, I am minded to give the following experience. I was in Ottawa, bound west over the Canadian Pacific. Three thousand miles of that road stretched before me. It was the fall of the year, and I had to cross Manitoba and the Rocky Mountains. I could expect crimpy weather, and every moment of delay increased the frigid hardships of the journey. Furthermore, I was disgusted. The distance between Montreal and Ottawa is one hundred and twenty miles. I ought to know, for I had just come over it and it had taken me six days. By mistake I had missed the main line, and come over a small jerk with only two locals a day on it. And during these six days I had lived on dry crusts, and not enough of them begged from the French peasants. Furthermore, my disgust had been heightened by the one day I had spent in Ottawa trying to get an outfit of clothing for my long journey. Let me put it on record right here that Ottawa, with one exception, is the hardest town in the United States and Canada to beg clothes in. The one exception is Washington, D.C. The latter fair city is the limit. I spent two weeks there trying to beg a pair of shoes, and then had to go on to Jersey City before I got them. But to return to Ottawa. At eight sharp in the morning I started out after clothes. I worked energetically all day. I swear I walked forty miles. I interviewed the housewives of a thousand homes. I did not even knock off work for dinner. And at six in the afternoon, after ten hours of unremitting and depressing toil, I was still shy one shirt, while the pair of trousers I had managed to acquire was tight, and moreover was showing all the signs of an early disintegration. At six I quit work and headed for the railroad yards, expecting to pick up something to eat on the way. But my hard luck was still with me. I was refused food at house after house. Then I got a handout. My spirit soared, for it was the largest handout I had ever seen in a long and varied experience. It was a parcel wrapped in newspapers and as big as a mature suitcase. I hurried to a vacant lot and opened it. First I saw cake, then more cake, all kinds and makes of cake, and then some. It was all cake. No bread and butter with thick firm slices of meat between. Nothing but cake. And I, who of all things, abhorred cake most. In another age and clime they sat down by the waters of Babylon and wept. And in a vacant lot in Canada's proud capital, I too sat down and wept, over a mountain of cake. As one looks upon the face of his dead son, so looked I upon this multitudinous pastry. I suppose I was an ungrateful tramp, for I refused to partake of the bounteousness of the house that had had a party the night before. Evidently, the guest hadn't liked cake either. That cake marked the crisis in my fortunes. Then it, nothing could be worse. Therefore, things must begin to mend. And they did. At the very next house, I was given a set-down. Now, a set-down is the height of bliss. One is taken inside, very often is given a chance to wash, and is then set down at a table. Tramps love to show their legs under a table. The house was large and comfortable, in the midst of spacious grounds and fine trees, and sat well back from the street. They had just finished eating, and I was taken right into the dining room, in itself a most unusual happening, for the tramp who is lucky enough to win a set-down usually receives it in the kitchen. A grizzled and gracious Englishman, his matronly wife, and a beautiful young Frenchwoman talked with me while I ate. I wonder if that beautiful young Frenchwoman would remember at this late day the laugh I gave her when I uttered the barbaric phrase, two bits. You see, I was trying delicately to hit them for a light piece. That was how the sum of money came to be mentioned. What? she said. Two bits, said I. Her mouth was twitching as she again said, What? Two bits, said I. Whereat she burst into laughter. Won't you repeat it? she said, when she had regained control of herself. Two bits, said I. 
and once more she rippled into uncontrollable silvery laughter. "'I beg your pardon,' said she. "'But what—what what was it you said?' Two bits,' said I. "'Is there anything wrong about it?' "'Not that I know of,' she gurgled between gasps. "'But what does it mean?' I explained, but I do not remember now whether or not I got that two bits out of her. But I have often wondered since as to which of us was the provincial. When I arrived at the depot I found, much to my disgust, a bunch of at least twenty tramps that were waiting to ride out the blind baggages of the overland. Now two or three tramps on the blind baggage are all right. They are inconspicuous. But a score? That meant trouble. No train crew would ever let all of us ride. I may as well explain here what a blind baggage is. Some mail cars are built without doors in the ends. Hence, such a car is blind. The mail cars that possess end doors have those doors always locked. Suppose, after the train has started, that a tramp gets onto the platform of one of these blind cars. There is no door, or the door is locked. No conductor or brakeman can get to him to collect fare or throw him off. It is clear that the tramp is safe until the next time the train stops. Then he must get off, run ahead in the darkness, and when the train pulls by, jump on to the blind again. But there are ways and ways, as we shall see. When the train pulled out, those twenty tramps swarmed upon the three blinds. Some climbed on before the train had run a car length. They were awkward dubs, and I saw their speedy finish. Of course, the train crew was on, and at the first stop the trouble began. I jumped off and ran forward along the track. I noticed that I was accompanied by a number of the tramps. They evidently knew their business. When one is beating an overland, he must always keep well ahead of the train at the stops. I ran ahead, and as I ran, one by one, those that accompanied me dropped out. This dropping out was the measure of their skill and nerve in boarding a train. For this is the way it works. When the train starts, the shack rides out the blind. There is no way for him to get back into the train proper except by jumping off the blind and catching a platform where the car ends are not blind. When the train is going as fast as the shack cares to risk, he therefore jumps off the blind, lets several cars go by, and gets on to the train. So it is up to the tramp to run so far ahead that before the blind is opposite him, the shack will have already vacated it. I dropped the last tramp by about fifty feet and waited. The train started. I saw the lantern of the shack on the first blind. He was riding her out, and I saw the dub stand forlornly by the track as the blind went by. They made no attempt to get on. They were beaten by their own inefficiency at the very start. After them, in the lineup, came the tramps that knew a little something about the game. They let the first blind, occupied by the shack, go by, and jumped on the second and third blind. Of course, the shack jumped off the first and on to the second as it went by and scrambled around there, throwing off the men who had boarded it. But the point is that I was so far ahead that when the first blind came opposite me, the shack had already left it and was tangled up with the tramps on the second blind. A half dozen of the more skillful tramps who had run far enough ahead made the first blind too. At the next stop, as we ran forward along the track, I counted but fifteen of us five had been ditched. The weeding out process had begun nobly, and it continued station by station. Now we were fourteen, now twelve, now eleven, now nine, now eight. It reminded me of the ten little niggers of the nursery rhyme. I was resolved that I should be the last little nigger of all. And why not? Was I not blessed with strength, agility, and youth? I was eighteen and in perfect condition. And didn't I have my nerve with me? And furthermore, was I not a tramp royal? Were not these other tramps mere dubs and gay cats and amateurs alongside of me? If I weren't the last little nigger, I might as well quit the game and get a job on an alfalfa farm somewhere. By the time our number had been reduced to four, the whole train crew had become interested. From then on it was a contest of skill and wits, with the odds in favor of the crew. One by one, the three other survivors turned up missing until I alone remained. My, but I was proud of myself. No Croesus was ever prouder of his first million. I was holding her down in spite of two brakemen, a conductor, a fireman, and an engineer. And here are a few samples of the way I held her down. 
Out ahead, in the darkness, so far ahead that the shack riding out the blind must perforce get off before it reaches me, I get on. Very well. I am good for another station. When that station is reached, I dart ahead again to repeat the maneuver. The train pulls out. I watch her coming. There is no light of a lantern on the blind. Has the crew abandoned the fight? I do not know. One never knows, and one must be prepared every moment for anything. As the first blind comes opposite me, and I run to leap aboard, I strain my eyes to see if the shack is on the platform. For all I know, he may be there, with his lantern doused, and even as I spring upon the steps, that lantern may smash down upon my head. I ought to know. I have been hit by lanterns two or three times. But no, the first blind is empty. The train is gathering speed. I am safe for another station. But am I? I feel the train slacken speed. On the instant I am alert. A maneuver is being executed against me, and I do not know what it is. I try to watch on both sides at once, not forgetting to keep track of the tender in front of me. From any one or all of these three directions I may be assailed. Ah, there it comes. The shack has ridden out the engine. My first warning is when his feet strike the steps of the right-hand side of the blind. Like a flash, I am off the blind to the left and running ahead past the engine. I lose myself in the darkness. The situation is where it has been ever since the train left Ottawa. I am ahead, and the train must come past me if it is to proceed on its journey. I have as good a chance as ever for boarding her. I watch carefully. I see a lantern come forward to the engine and I do not see it go back from the engine. It must, therefore, be still on the engine, and it is a fair assumption that attached to the handle of that lantern is a shack. That shack was lazy, or else he would have put out his lantern instead of trying to shield it as he came forward. The train pulls out. The first blind is empty, and I gain it. As before, the train slackens, the shack from the engine boards the blind from one side, and I go off the other side and run forward. As I wait in the darkness, I am conscious of a big thrill of pride. The overland has stopped twice for me. For me, a poor hobo on the bum. I alone have twice stopped the overland with its many passengers and coaches, its government mail, and its two thousand steam horses straining in the engine. And I weigh only one hundred and sixty pounds, and I haven't a five-cent piece in my pocket. Again, I see the lantern come forward to the engine. But this time it comes conspicuously, a bit too conspicuously to suit me, and I wonder what is up. At any rate, I have something else to be afraid of than the shack on the engine. The train pulls by. Just in time, before I make my spring, I see the dark form of a shack, without a lantern, on the first blind. I let it go by and prepare to board the second blind. But the shack on the first blind has jumped off and is at my heels. Also, I have a fleeting glimpse of the lantern of the shack who rode out the engine. He has jumped off, and now both shacks are on the ground on the same side with me. The next moment, the second blind comes by, and I am aboard it. But I do not linger. I have figured out my counter move. As I dash across the platform, I hear the impact of the shack's feet against the steps as he boards. I jump off the other side and run forward with the train. My plan is to run forward and get on the first blind. It is nip and tuck, for the train is gathering speed. Also, the shack is behind me and running after me. I guess I am the better sprinter, for I make the first blind. I stand on the step and watch my pursuer. He is only about ten feet back and running hard, but now the train has approximated his own speed, and relative to me, he is standing still. I encourage him, hold out my hand to him, but he explodes in a mighty oath, gives up, and makes the train several cars back. The train is speeding along, and I am still chuckling to myself, when, without warning, a spray of water strikes me. The fireman is playing the hose on me from the engine. I step forward from the car platform to the rear of the tender, where I am sheltered under the overhang. The water flies harmlessly over my head. My fingers itch to climb up on the tender and lamb that fireman with a chunk of coal. But I know if I do that, I'll be massacred by him and the engineer, and I refrain. At the next stop, I am off and ahead in the darkness. This time, when the train pulls out, both shacks are on the first blind. I divine their game. They have blocked the repetition of my previous play. I cannot again take the second blind, cross over, and run forward to the first. As soon as the first blind passes, and I do not get on, 
They swing off, one on each side of the train. I board the second blind, and as I do so, I know that a moment later, simultaneously, those two shacks will arrive on both sides of me. It is like a trap. Both ways are blocked, yet there is another way out, and that way is up. So I do not wait for my pursuers to arrive. I climb upon the upright ironwork of the platform and stand upon the wheel of the handbrake. This has taken up the moment of grace, and I hear the shacks strike the steps on either side. I don't stop to look. I raise my arms overhead until my hands rest against the down-curving ends of the roofs of the two cars. One hand, of course, is on the curved roof of one car, and the other hand on the curved roof of the other car. By this time, both shacks are coming up the steps. I know it, though I am too busy to see them. All this is happening in the space of only several seconds. I make a spring with my legs and muscle myself up with my arms. As I draw up my legs, both shacks reach for me and clutch empty air. I know this, for I look down and see them. Also, I hear them swear. I am now in a precarious position, riding the ends of the down-curving roofs of two cars at the same time. With a quick, tense movement, I transfer both legs to the curve of one roof and both hands to the curve of the other roof. Then gripping the edge of that curving roof, I climb over the curve to the level roof above, where I sit down to catch my breath, holding on the while to a ventilator that projects above the surface. I am on top of the train, on the decks, as the tramps call it, and this process I have described is by them called decking her. And let me say right here that only a young and vigorous tramp is able to deck a passenger train, and also that the young and vigorous tramp must have his nerve with him as well. The train goes on gathering speed, and I know I am safe until the next stop, but only until the next stop. If I remain on the roof after the train stops, I know those shacks will fusillade me with rocks. A healthy shack can do drop a pretty heavy chunk of stone on top of a car, say anywhere from 5 to 20 pounds. On the other hand, the chances are large that at the next stop the shacks will be waiting for me to descend at the place I climbed up. It is up to me to climb down at some other platform. Registering a fervent hope that there are no tunnels in the next half mile, I rise to my feet and walk down the train half a dozen cars. And let me say that one must leave timidity behind him on such a passer. The roofs of passenger coaches are not made for midnight promenades. And if anyone thinks they are, let me advise him to try it. Just let him walk along the roof of a jolting, lurching car, with nothing to hold on to but the black and empty air, and when he comes to the down-curving end of the roof, all wet and slippery with dew, let him accelerate his speed so as to step across to the next roof, down-curving and wet and slippery. Believe me, he will learn whether his heart is weak or his head is giddy. As the train slows down for a stop, half a dozen platforms from where I had decked her, I come down. No one is on the platform. When the train comes to a standstill, I slip off to the ground. Ahead and between me and the engine are two moving lanterns. The shacks are looking for me on the roofs of the cars. I note that the car beside which I am standing is a four-wheeler, by which is meant that it has only four wheels to each track. When you go underneath on the rods, be sure to avoid the six-wheelers. They lead to disasters. I duck under the train and make for the rods and I can tell you I am mighty glad that the train is standing still. It is the first time I have ever gone underneath on the Canadian Pacific, and the internal arrangements are new to me. I try to crawl over the top of the truck, between the truck and the bottom of the car, but the space is not large enough for me to squeeze through. This is new to me. Down in the United States, I am accustomed to going underneath on rapidly moving trains, seizing a gunnel and swinging my feet under to the brake beam and from there crawling over the top of the truck and down inside the truck to a seat on the cross rod. Feeling with my hands in the darkness, I learn that there is room between the brake drum and the ground. It is a tight squeeze. I have to lie flat and worm my way through. Once inside the truck, I take my seat on the rod and wonder what the shacks are thinking has become of me. The train gets under way. They have given me up at last. But have they? At the very next stop, I see a lantern thrust under the next truck to mine at the other end of the car. They are searching the rods for me. I must make my getaway pretty lively. I crawl on my stomach under the brake beam. They see me and run for me. 
but I crawl on hands and knees across the rail on the opposite side and gain my feet. Then away I go for the head of the train. I run past the engine and hide in the sheltering darkness. It is the same old situation. I am ahead of the train, and the train must go past me. The train pulls out. There is a lantern on the first blind. I lie low and see the peering shack go by. But there is also a lantern on the second blind. That shack spots me and calls to the shack who has just gone past on the first blind. Both jump off. Never mind, I'll take the third blind and deck her. But heavens, there is a lantern on the third blind, too. It is the conductor. I let it go by. At any rate, I have now the full train crew in front of me. I turn and run back in the opposite direction to what the train is going. I look over my shoulder. All three lanterns are on the ground and wobbling along in pursuit. I sprint. Half the train has gone by, and it is moving quite fast when I spring aboard. I know that the two shacks and the conductor will arrive like ravening wolves in about two seconds. I spring upon the wheel of the handbrake, get my hands on the curved ends of the roofs, and muscle myself up to the decks, while my disappointed pursuers, clustering on the platform beneath like dogs that have treated a cat, howl curses up at me and say unsocial things about my ancestors. But what does that matter? It is five to one, including the engineer and fireman, and the majesty of the law and the might of a great corporation are behind them, and I am beating them out. I am too far down the train, and I run ahead over the roofs of the coaches until I am over the fifth or sixth platform from the engine. I peer down cautiously. A shack is on that platform. That he has caught sight of me, I know from the way he makes a swift sneak inside the car, and I know also that he is waiting inside the door, all ready to pounce out on me when I climb down. But I make believe that I don't know, and I remain there to encourage him in his error. I do not see him, yet I know that he opens the door once and peeps up to assure himself that I am still there. The train slows down for a station. I dangle my legs down in a tentative way. The train stops. My legs are still dangling. I hear the door unlatch softly. He is all ready for me. Suddenly I spring up and run forward over the roof. This is right over his head, where he lurks inside the door. The train is standing still, the night is quiet, and I take care to make plenty of noise on the metal roof with my feet. I don't know, but my assumption is that he is now running forward to catch me as I descend at the next platform. But I don't descend there. Halfway along the roof of the coach, I turn, retrace my way softly and quickly to the platform both the shack and I have just abandoned. The coast is clear. I descend to the ground on the off side of the train and hide in the darkness. Not a soul has seen me. I go over to the fence at the edge of the right-of-way and watch. Aha! What's that? I see a lantern on top of the train moving along from front to rear. They think I haven't come down, and they are searching the roofs for me. And better than that, on the ground on each side of the train, moving abreast with the lantern on top, are two other lanterns. It is a rabbit drive, and I am the rabbit. When the shack on top flushes me, the ones on each side will nab me. I roll a cigarette and watch the procession go by. Once past me, I am safe to proceed to the front of the train. She pulls out, and I make the front blind without opposition. But before she is fully under way, and just as I am lighting my cigarette, I am aware that the fireman has climbed over the coal to the back of the tender and is looking down at me. I am filled with apprehension. From his position he can mash me to a jelly with lumps of coal. Instead of which he addresses me, and I note with relief the admiration in his voice. You son of a gun, is what he says. It is a high compliment, and I thrill as a schoolboy thrills on receiving a reward of merit. Say, I call up to him, don't you play the hose on me any more. All right, he answers, and goes back to his work. I have made friends with the engine, but the shacks are still looking for me. At the next stop, the shacks ride out all three blinds, and as before, I let them go by and deck in the middle of the train. The crew is on its metal by now, and the train stops. The shacks are going to ditch me or know the reason why. Three times the mighty overland stops for me at that station, and each time I elude the shacks and make the docks. But it is hopeless, for they have finally come to an understanding of the situation. I have taught them that they cannot guard the train from me. They must do something else. And they do it. 
When the train stops that last time, they take after me hot-footed. Ah, I see their game. They are trying to run me down. At first, they herd me back toward the rear of the train. I know my peril. Once to the rear of the train, it will pull out with me left behind. I double and twist and turn, dodge through my pursuers, and gain the front of the train. One shack still hangs on after me. All right, I'll give him the run of his life, for my wind is good. I run straight ahead along the track. It doesn't matter. If he chases me ten miles, he'll nevertheless have to catch the train, and I can board her at any speed that he can. So I run on, keeping just comfortably ahead of him, and straining my eyes in the gloom for cattle guards and switches that may bring me to grief. Alas, I strain my eyes too far ahead, and trip over something just under my feet. I know not what, some little thing, and go down to earth in a long stumbling fall. The next moment I am on my feet, but the shack has me by the collar. I do not struggle. I am busy with breathing deeply and with sizing him up. He is narrow-shouldered, and I have at least thirty pounds the better of him in weight. Besides, he is just as tired as I am, and if he tries to slug me, I'll teach him a few things. But he doesn't try to slug me, and that problem is settled. Instead, he starts to lead me back toward the train, and another possible problem arises. I see the lanterns of the conductor and the other shack. We are approaching them. Not for nothing have I made the acquaintance of the New York police. Not for nothing, in boxcars, by water tanks, and in prison cells, have I listened to bloody tales of manhandling. What if these three men are about to manhandle me? Heaven knows I have given them provocation enough. I think quickly. We are drawing nearer and nearer to the other two trainmen. I line up the stomach and the jaw of my captor, and plan the right and left I'll give him at the first sign of trouble. Pshaw! I know another trick I'd like to work on him, and I almost regret that I did not do it at the moment I was captured. I could make him sick, what of his clutch on my collar. His fingers, tight-gripping, are buried inside my collar. My coat is tightly buttoned. Did you ever see a tourniquet? Well, this is one. All I have to do is to duck my head under his arm and begin to twist. I must twist rapidly, very rapidly. I know how to do it twisting in a violent, jerky way, ducking my head under his arm with each revolution. Before he knows it, those detaining fingers of his will be detained. He will be unable to withdraw them. It is a powerful leverage. Twenty seconds after I have started revolving, the blood will be bursting out of his finger ends, the delicate tendons will be rupturing, and all the muscles and nerves will be mashing and crushing together in a shrieking mass. Try it some time when somebody has you by the collar. But be quick, quick as lightning. Also, be sure to hug yourself while you are revolving. Hug your face with your left arm and your abdomen with your right. You see, the other fellow might try to stop you with a punch from his free arm. It would be a good idea, too, to revolve away from that free arm rather than toward it. A punch going is never so bad as a punch coming. That shack will never know how near he was to being made very, very sick. All that saves him is that it is not in their plan to manhandle me. When we draw near enough, he calls out that he has me, and they signal the train to come on. The engine passes us, and the three blinds. After that, the conductor and the other shack swing aboard. But still, my captor holds on to me. I see the plan. He is going to hold me until the rear of the train goes by, then he will hop on, and I shall be left behind, ditched. But the train has pulled out fast, the engineer trying to make up for lost time. Also, it is a long train. It is going very lively, and I know the shack is measuring its speed with apprehension. Think you can make it? I query innocently. He releases my collar, makes a quick run, and swings aboard. A number of coaches are yet to pass by. He knows it, and remains on the steps, his head poked out and watching me. In that moment, my next move comes to me. I'll make the last platform. I know she's going fast and faster, but I'll only get a roll in the dirt if I fail, and the optimism of youth is mine. I do not give myself away. I stand with a dejected droop of shoulder, advertising that I have abandoned hope. But at the same time, I am feeling with my feet the good gravel. It is perfect footing. Also, I am watching the poked-out head of the shack. I see it withdrawn. He is confident that the train is going too fast for me ever to make it. 
And the train is going fast, faster than any train I have ever tackled. As the last coach comes by, I sprint in the same direction with it. It is a swift, short sprint. I cannot hope to equal the speed of the train, but I can reduce the difference of our speed to the minimum, and hence reduce the shock of impact when I leap on board. In the fleeting instant of darkness, I do not see the iron handrail of the last platform, nor is there time for me to locate it. I reach for where I think it ought to be, and at the same instant my feet leave the ground. It is all in the toss. The next moment I may be rolling in the gravel with broken ribs or arms or head. But my fingers grip the handhold, there is a jerk on my arms that slightly pivots my body, and my feet land on the steps with sharp violence. I sit down, feeling proud of myself. In all my hoboing, it is the best bit of train jumping I have done. I know that late at night one is always good for several stations on the last platform. But I do not care to trust myself at the rear of the train. At the first stop, I run forward on the off side of the train, past the Pullmans, and duck under and take a rod under a day coach. At the next stop, I run forward again and take another rod. I am now comparatively safe. The shacks think I am ditched, but the long day and the strenuous night are beginning to tell on me. Also, it is not so windy nor cold underneath, and I begin to doze. This will never do. Sleep on the rods spells death. So I crawl out at a station and go forward to the second blind. Here I can lie down and sleep, and here I do sleep. How long, I do not know, for I am awakened by a lantern thrust into my face. The two shacks are staring at me. I scramble up on the defensive, wondering as to which one is going to make the first pass at me. But slugging is far from their minds. I thought you was ditched, says the shack who had held me by the collar. If you hadn't let go of me when you did, you'd have been ditched along with me, I answer. How's that? he asks. I'd have gone into a clinch with you, that's all, is my reply. They hold a consultation, and their verdict is summed up in... Well, I guess you can ride, Bo. There's no use trying to keep you off. And they go away and leave me in peace to the end of their division. I have given the foregoing as a sample of what holding her down means. Of course, I have selected a fortunate night out of my experiences, and said nothing of the nights, and many of them, when I was tripped up by accident and ditched. In conclusion, I want to tell of what happened when I reached the end of the division. On single track, transcontinental lines, the freight trains wait at the divisions and follow out after the passenger trains. When the division was reached, I left my train and looked for the freight that would pull out behind it. I found the freight, made up on a side track and waiting. I climbed into a box car half full of coal and lay down. In no time, I was asleep. I was awakened by the sliding open of the door. Day was just dawning, cold and gray, and the freight had not yet started. A con, conductor, was poking his head inside the door. Get out of that, you blankety blank blank, he roared at me. I got, and outside I watched him go down the line inspecting every car in the train. When he got out of sight, I thought to myself that he would never think I'd have the nerve to climb back into the very car out of which he had fired me. So back I climbed and laid down again. Now that con's mental processes must have been paralleling mine for he reasoned that it was the very thing I would do. For back he came and fired me out. Now surely, I reasoned, he will never dream that I'd do it a third time. Back I went into the very same car, but I decided to make sure. Only one side door could be opened. The other side door was nailed up. Beginning at the top of the coal, I dug a hole alongside of that door and lay down in it. I heard the other door open. The con climbed up and looked in over the top of the coal. He couldn't see me. He called to me to get out. I tried to fool him by remaining quiet. But when he began tossing chunks of coal into the hole on top of me, I gave up and for the third time was fired out. Also, he informed me in warm terms of what would happen to me if he caught me in there again. I changed my tactics. When a man is paralleling your mental processes, ditch him. Abruptly break off your line of reasoning and go off on a new line. This I did. I hid between some cars on an adjacent sidetrack and watched. Sure enough, that con came back again to the car. He opened the door, he climbed up, he called, he threw coal into the hole I had made. 
He even crawled over the coal and looked into the hole. That satisfied him. Five minutes later, the freight was pulling out, and he was not in sight. I ran alongside the car, pulled the door open, and climbed in. He never looked for me again, and I rode that coal car precisely 1,022 miles, sleeping most of the time and getting out at divisions, where the freights always stop for an hour or so to beg my food. And at the end of the 1,022 miles, I lost that car through a happy incident. I got a set-down, and the tramp doesn't live who won't miss a train for a set-down any time. End of Chapter 2 Chapter 3 of The Road by Jack London Chapter 3 Pictures What do it matter where or how we die, so long as we've our elf to watch it all? Sestina of the Tramp Royal Perhaps the greatest charm of tramp life is the absence of monotony. In Hobo Land, the face of life is protean, an ever-changing phantasmagoria, where the impossible happens and the unexpected jumps out of the bushes at every turn of the road. The hobo never knows what is going to happen the next moment. Hence, he lives only in the present moment. He has learned the futility of telic endeavor, and knows the delight of drifting along with the whimsicalities of chance. Often, I think over my tramp days, and ever I marvel at the swift succession of pictures that flash up in my memory. It matters not where I begin to think. Any day of all the days is a day apart, with a record of swift moving pictures all its own. For instance, I remember a sunny summer morning in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and immediately comes to my mind the auspicious beginning of the day. A set-down with two maiden ladies, and not in their kitchen, but in their dining room, with them beside me at the table. We ate eggs out of egg cups. It was the first time I had ever seen egg cups, or heard of egg cups. I was a bit awkward at first, I'll confess, but I was hungry and unabashed. I mastered the egg cup, and I mastered the eggs in a way that made those two maiden ladies sit up. Why, they ate like a couple of canaries, dabbling with the one egg each they took, and nibbling at tiny wafers of toast. Life was low in their bodies, their blood ran thin, and they had slept warm all night. I had been out all night, consuming much fuel of my body to keep warm, beating my way down from a place called Emporium in the northern part of the state. Wafers of toast, out of sight, but each wafer was no more than a mouthful to me, nay, no more than a bite. It is tedious to have to reach for another piece of toast each bite when one is potential with many bites. When I was a very little lad, I had a very little dog called Punch. I saw to his feeding myself. Someone in the household had shot a lot of ducks, and we had a fine meat dinner. When I had finished, I prepared Punch's dinner, a large plateful of bones and tidbits. I went outside to give it to him. Now it happened that a visitor had ridden over from a neighboring ranch, and with him had come a Newfoundland dog as big as a calf. I set the plate on the ground. Punch wagged his tail and began. He had before him a blissful half-hour at least. There was a sudden rush. Punch was brushed aside like a straw in the path of a cyclone, and that Newfoundland swooped down upon the plate. In spite of his huge maw, he must have been trained to quick lunches, for in the fleeting instant before he received the kick in the ribs I aimed at him, he completely engulfed the contents of the plate. He swept it clean. One last lingering lick of his tongue removed even the grease stains. As that big Newfoundland behaved at the plate of my dog Punch, so behaved I at the table of those two maiden ladies of Harrisburg. I swept it bare. I didn't break anything, but I cleaned out the egg and the toast and the coffee. The servant brought more, but I kept her busy, and ever she brought more and more. The coffee was delicious, but it needn't have been served in such tiny cups. What time had I to eat when it took all my time to prepare the many cups of coffee for drinking? At any rate, it gave my tongue time to wag. Those two maiden ladies, with their pink and white complexions and gray curls, had never looked upon the bright face of adventure. As the Tramp Royal would have it, they had worked all their lives on one same shift. Into the sweet scents and narrow confines of their uneventful existence I brought the large airs of the world, freighted with the lusty smells of sweat and strife, and with the tangs and odors of strange lands and soils. 
and right well I scratched their soft palms with the callus of my own palms, the half-inch horn that comes of pull and haul of rope and long and arduous hours of caressing shovel handles. This I did, not merely in the braggadocio of youth, but to prove, by toil performed, the claim I had upon their charity. Ah, I can see them now, those dear sweet ladies, just as I sat at their breakfast table twelve years ago, discoursing upon the way of my feet in the world, brushing aside their kindly counsel as a real devilish fellow should, and thrilling them, not alone with my own adventures, but with the adventures of all the other fellows with whom I had rubbed shoulders and exchanged confidences. I appropriated them all, the adventures of the other fellows, I mean, and if those maiden ladies had been less trustful and guileless, they could have tangled me up beautifully in my chronology. Well, well, and what of it? It was fair exchange, for their many cups of coffee and eggs and bites of toast I gave full value. Right royally I gave them entertainment. My coming to sit at their table was their adventure, and adventure is beyond price anyway. Coming along the street, after parting from the maiden ladies, I gathered in a newspaper from the doorway of some late riser, and in a grassy park lay down to get in touch with the last twenty-four hours of the world. There, in the park, I met a fellow hobo who told me his life story, and who wrestled with me to join the United States Army. He had given in to the recruiting officer, and was just about to join, and he couldn't see why I shouldn't join with him. He had been a member of Coxey's army in the march to Washington several months before, and that seemed to have given him a taste for army life. I, too, was a veteran, for had I not been a private in Company L of the 2nd Division of Kelly's Industrial Army, said Company L being commonly known as the Nevada Push. But my army experience had had the opposite effect on me, so I left that hobo to go his way to the dogs of war, while I threw my feet for dinner. This duty performed, I started to walk across the bridge over the Susquehanna to the west shore. I forget the name of the railroad that ran down that side, but while lying in the grass in the morning, the idea had come to me to go to Baltimore. So to Baltimore I was going on that railroad, whatever its name was. It was a warm afternoon, and part way across the bridge I came to a lot of fellows who were in swimming off one of the piers. Off went my clothes, and in went I. The water was fine, but when I came out and dressed, I found I had been robbed. Someone had gone through my clothes. Now I leave it to you, if being robbed isn't in itself adventure enough for one day. I have known men who have been robbed and who have talked all the rest of their lives about it. True, the thief that went through my clothes didn't get much, some thirty or forty cents in nickels and pennies, and my tobacco and cigarette papers, but it was all I had, which is more than most men can be robbed of for they have something left at home, while I had no home. It was a pretty tough gang in swimming there. I sized up and knew better than to squeal, so I begged the makings and I could have sworn it was one of my own papers I rolled the tobacco in. Then on across the bridge I hiked to the west shore. Here ran the railroad I was after. No station was in sight. How to catch a freight without walking to a station was the problem. I noticed that the track came up a steep grade, culminating at the point where I had tapped it, and I knew that a heavy freight couldn't pull up there any too lively. But how lively? On the opposite side of the track rose a high bank. On the edge, at the top, I saw a man's head sticking up from the grass. Perhaps he knew how fast the freights took the grade, and when the next one went south. I called out my questions to him, and he motioned to me to come up. I obeyed, and when I reached the top, I found four other men lying in the grass with him. I took in the scene and knew them for what they were, American gypsies. In the open space that extended back among the trees from the edge of the bank were several nondescript wagons. Ragged, half-naked children swarmed over the camp, though I noticed that they took care not to come near and bother the menfolk. Several lean, unbeautiful, and toil-degraded women were pottering about with camp chores, and one I noticed who sat by herself on the seat of one of the wagons, her head drooped forward, her knees drawn up to her chin, and clasped limply by her arms. She did not look happy. She looked as if she did not care for anything. In this I was wrong, for later I was to learn that there was something for which she did care. The full measure of human suffering was in her face, and in addition there was the tragic expression of incapacity for further suffering. Nothing could hurt any more was what her face seemed to portray. But in this, too, I was wrong. 
I lay in the grass on the edge of the steep and talked with the menfolk. We were kin, brothers. I was the American hobo, and they were the American gypsy. I knew enough of their argot for conversation, and they knew enough of mine. There were two more in their gang who were across the river mushing in Harrisburg. A musher is an itinerant fakir. This word is not to be confounded with the Klondike musher, though the origin of both terms may be the same, namely, the corruption of the French marchands, to march, to walk, to mush. The particular graft of the two mushers who had crossed the river was umbrella mending, but what real graft lay behind their umbrella mending I was not told, nor would it have been polite to ask. It was a glorious day. Not a breath of wind was stirring, and we basked in the shimmering warmth of the sun. From everywhere arose the drowsy hum of insects, and the balmy air was filled with scents of the sweet earth and the green growing things. We were too lazy to do more than mumble on in intermittent conversation. And then, all abruptly, the peace and quietude was jarred awry by man. Two bare-legged boys of eight or nine, in some minor way, broke some rule of the camp. What it was I did not know, and a man who lay beside me suddenly sat up and called to them. He was chief of the tribe, a man with narrow forehead and narrow slitted eyes, whose thin lips and twisted sardonic features explained why the two boys jumped and tensed like startled deer at the sound of his voice. The alertness of fear was in their faces, and they turned, in a panic, to run. He called to them to come back, and one boy lagged behind reluctantly, his meager little frame portraying in pantomime the struggle within him between fear and reason. He wanted to come back. His intelligence and past experience told him that to come back was a lesser evil than to run on. But lesser evil that it was, it was great enough to put wings to his fear and urge his feet to flight. Still, he lagged and struggled until he reached the shelter of the trees where he halted. The chief of the tribe did not pursue. He sauntered over to a wagon and picked up a heavy whip. Then he came back to the center of the open space and stood still. He did not speak. He made no gestures. He was the law, pitiless and omnipotent. He merely stood there and waited. And I knew, and all knew, and the two boys in the shelter of the trees knew, for what he waited. The boy who had lagged slowly came back. His face was stamped with quivering resolution. He did not falter. He had made up his mind to take his punishment. And mark you, the punishment was not for the original offense, but for the offense of running away. And in this, that tribal chieftain but behaved as behaves the exalted society in which he lived. We punish our criminals, and when they escape and run away, we bring them back and add to their punishment. Straight up to the chief the boy came, halting at the proper distance for the swish of the lash. The whip hissed through the air, and I caught myself with a start of surprise at the weight of the blow. The thin little leg was so very thin and little. The flesh showed white where the lash had curled and bitten, and then, where the white had shown, sprang up the savage welt, and here and there along its length little scarlet oozings where the skin had broken. Again the whip swung, and the boy's whole body winced in anticipation of the blow, though he did not move from the spot. His will held good. A second well sprang up, and a third. It was not until the fourth landed that the boy screamed. Also he could no longer stand still, and from then on, blow after blow, he danced up and down in his anguish, screaming. But he did not attempt to run away. If his involuntary dancing took him beyond the reach of the whip, he danced back into range again. And when it was all over, a dozen blows, he went away, whimpering and squealing among the wagons. The chief stood still and waited. The second boy came out from the trees, but he did not come straight. He came like a cringing dog, obsessed by little panics that made him turn and dart away for half a dozen steps. But always he turned and came back, circling nearer and nearer to the man, whimpering, making inarticulate animal noises in his throat. I saw that he never looked at the man. His eyes always were fixed upon the whip, and in his eyes was a terror that made me sick, the frantic terror of an inconceivably maltreated child. I have seen strong men dropping right and left out of battle and squirming in their death throes. I have seen them by scores blown into the air by bursting shells and their bodies torn asunder. Believe me, the witnessing was as merrymaking and laughter and song to me in comparison with the way the sight of that poor child affected me. The whipping began. The whipping of the first boy was as play compared with this one. 
In no time the blood was running down his thin little legs. He danced and squirmed and doubled up, till it seemed almost that he was some grotesque marionette operated by strings. I say seemed, for his screaming gave the lie to the seeming and stamped it with reality. His shrieks were shrill and piercing. Within them no hoarse notes, but only the thin sexlessness of the voice of a child. The time came when the boy could stand it no more. Reason fled, and he tried to run away. But now the man followed up, curbing his flight, hurting him with blows back always into the open space. Then came interruption. I heard a wild smothered cry. The woman, who sat in the wagon seat, had come out and was running to interfere. She sprang between the man and boy. You want some, eh? said he with the whip. All right, then. He swung the whip upon her. Her skirts were long, so he did not try for her legs. He drove the lash for her face, which she shielded as best she could with her hands and forearms, drooping her head forward between her lean shoulders, and on the lean shoulders and arms receiving the blows. Heroic mother. She knew just what she was doing. The boy, still shrieking, was making his getaway to the wagons. And all the while the four men lay beside me and watched and made no move. Nor did I move, and without shame I say it though my reason was compelled to struggle hard against my natural impulse to rise up and interfere. I knew life. Of what use to the woman, or to me, would be my being beaten to death by five men there on the bank of the Susquehanna. I once saw a man hanged, and though my whole soul cried protest, my mouth cried not. Had it cried, I should most likely have had my skull crushed by the butt of a revolver, for it was the law that the man should hang. And here, in this gypsy group, it was the law that the woman should be whipped. Even so, the reason in both cases that I did not interfere was not that it was the law, but that the law was stronger than I. Had it not been for those four men beside me in the grass, right gladly would I have waded into the man with the whip, and, bearing the accident of the landing on me with a knife or a club in the hands of some of the various women of the camp, I am confident that I should have beaten him into a mess." but the four men were beside me in the grass. They made their law stronger than I. Oh, believe me, I did my own suffering. I had seen women beaten before, often, but never had I seen such a beating as this. Her dress across the shoulders was cut into shreds. One blow that had passed her guard had raised a bloody welt from cheek to chin. Not one blow, nor two, not one dozen, nor two dozen, but endlessly, infinitely, that whiplash smote and curled about her, the sweat poured from me, and I breathed hard, clutching at the grass with my hands until I strained it out by the roots. And all the time my reason kept whispering, Fool! Fool! That welt on the face nearly did for me. I started to rise to my feet, but the hand of the man next to me went out to my shoulder and pressed me down. Easy, pardoner, easy. He warned me in a low voice. I looked at him. His eyes met mine unwaveringly. He was a large man, broad-shouldered and heavy-muscled and his face was lazy, phlegmatic, slothful, with all kindly, yet without passion, and quite soulless, a dim soul, unmalicious, unmoral, bovine, and stubborn. Just an animal he was, with no more than a faint flickering of intelligence, a good-natured brute with the strength and mental caliber of a gorilla. His hand pressed heavily upon me, and I knew the weight of the muscles behind. I looked at the other brutes, two of them unperturbed and incurious, and one of them that gloated over the spectacle. And my reason came back to me, my muscles relaxed, and I sank down in the grass. My mind went back to the two maiden ladies with whom I had had breakfast that morning. Less than two miles, as the crow flies, separated them from this scene. Here, in the windless day, under a beneficent sun, was a sister of theirs being beaten by a brother of mine. Here was a page of life they could never see, and better so, though for lack of seeing they would never be able to understand their sisterhood, nor themselves, nor know the clay of which they were made. For it is not given to woman to live in sweet-scented, narrow rooms, and at the same time be a little sister to all the world. The whipping was finished, and the woman, no longer screaming, went back to her seat in the wagon. Nor did the other women come to her, just then. They were afraid, but they came afterward, when a decent interval had elapsed. The man put the whip away and rejoined us, flinging himself down on the other side of me. He was breathing hard from his exertions. He wiped the sweat from his eyes on his coat sleeve and looked challengingly at me. I returned his look carelessly, 
What he had done was no concern of mine. I did not go away abruptly. I lay there half an hour longer, which, under the circumstances, was tact and etiquette. I rolled cigarettes from tobacco I borrowed from them, and when I slipped down the bank to the railroad, I was equipped with the necessary information for catching the next freight bound south. Well, and what of it? It was a page out of life, that's all, and there are many pages worse, far worse, that I have seen. I have sometimes held forth, facetiously, so my listeners believe, that the chief distinguishing trait between man and the other animals is that man is the only animal that maltreats the females of his kind. It is something of which no wolf nor cowardly coyote is ever guilty. It is something that even the dog, degenerated by domestication, will not do. The dog still retains the wild instinct in this matter, while man has lost most of his wild instincts, at least most of the good ones. Worse pages of life than what I have described? Read the reports on child labor in the United States. East, West, North, and South, it doesn't matter where, and know that all of us, profit mongers that we are, are typesetters and printers of worse pages of life than that mere page of wife beating on the Susquehanna. I went down the grade a hundred yards to where the footing beside the track was good. Here I could catch my freight as it pulled slowly up the hill, and here I found half a dozen hobos waiting for the same purpose. Several were playing seven-up with an old pack of cards. I took a hand. A coon began to shuffle the deck. He was fat and young and moon-faced. He beamed with good nature. It fairly oozed from him. As he dealt the first card to me, he paused and said, Say, Bo, ain't I done seen you before? You sure have, I answered. And you didn't have those same duds on, either. He was puzzled. Do you remember Buffalo? I queried. Then he knew me and with laughter and ejaculation hailed me as a comrade, for at Buffalo his clothes had been striped while he did his bit of time in the Erie County Penitentiary. For that matter, my clothes had been likewise striped, for I had been doing my bit of time too. The game proceeded, and I learned the stake for which we played. Down the bank, toward the river, descended a steep and narrow path that led to a spring some twenty-five feet beneath. We played on the edge of the bank. The man who was stuck, had to take a small condensed milk can, and with it carry water to the winners. The first game was played, and the coon was stuck. He took the small milk tin and climbed down the bank, while we sat above and guide him. We drank like fish. Four round trips he had to make for me alone, and the others were equally lavish with their thirst. The path was very steep, and sometimes the coon slipped when part way up, spilled the water, and had to go back for more. But he didn't get angry. He laughed as heartily as any of us. That was why he slipped so often. Also, he assured us of the prodigious quantities of water he would drink when someone else got stuck. When our thirst was quenched, another game was started. Again the coon was stuck, and again we drank our fill. A third game and a fourth ended the same way, and each time that moon-faced darky nearly died with delight at appreciation of the fate that chance was dealing out to him. And we nearly died with him, what of our delight. We laughed like careless children, or gods, there on the edge of the bank. I know I laughed till it seemed the top of my head would come off, and I drank from the milk tin till I was nigh waterlogged. Serious discussion arose as to whether we could successfully board the freight when it pulled up the grade, what of the weight of water secreted on our persons. This particular phase of the situation just about finished the coon. He had to break off from water carrying for at least five minutes while he lay down and rolled with laughter. The lengthening shadows stretched farther and farther across the river, and the soft, cool twilight came on, and ever we drank water, and ever our ebony cup-bearer brought more and more. Forgotten was the beaten woman of the hour before. That was a page read and turned over. I was busy now with this new page, and when the engine whistled on the grade, this page would be finished and another begun. And so the book of life goes on, page after page, and pages without end, when one is young. And then we played a game in which the coon failed to be stuck. The victim was a lean and dyspeptic-looking hobo, the one who had laughed least of all of us. We said we didn't want any water, which was the truth. Not the wealth of Ormuz and of Ind, nor the pressure of a pneumatic ram could have forced another drop into my saturated carcass. The coon looked disappointed, then rose to the occasion and guessed he'd have some. He had some, and then some, and then some. Ever the melancholy hobo climbed down and up the steep bank, and ever the coon called for more. He drank more water than all the rest of us put together. 
The twilight deepened into night, the stars came out, and he still drank on. I do believe that if the whistle of the freight hadn't sounded, he'd be there yet, swilling water and revenge while the melancholy hobo toiled down and up. But the whistle sounded, the page was done. We sprang to our feet and strung out alongside the track. There she came, coughing and spluttering up the grade, the headlight turning night into day and silhouetting us in sharp relief. The engine passed us, and we were all running with the train, some boarding on the side ladders, others springing the side doors of empty boxcars and climbing in. I caught a flat car loaded with mixed lumber and crawled away into a comfortable nook. I lay on my back with a newspaper under my head for a pillow. Above me, the stars were winking and wheeling in squadrons back and forth as the train rounded the curves, and watching them, I fell asleep. The day was done, one day of all my days. Tomorrow would be another day, and I was young. End of chapter 3